Good morning. If you're watching this online, good morning to you as well. It's great to have you uh, this morning. Just a couple of things. Um, next Sunday, uh, following our 8.30 service, so before uh, Sunday school, we will bring back our donut fellowship. It's just the time to see one another, maybe see people from other services you don't normally see, and uh, grab a donut and a coffee. Uh, so we'll do that next week, uh, beginning uh, next week. Also, our small groups start next week. We have a youth small group uh, that we have a sign-up for, then we have two adult uh, small groups that we have sign-ups for, and others will be happening. Uh, so um, those uh, sign-ups are on, down on the window of the office, so look, check those out. Um, during April, we have our IF conference coming up for our ladies. Uh, uh, check that out. If you have any questions, you can ask Allison. Allison, wave your hand right there. Um, so that's coming up in April. And uh, on Good Friday, the Friday before Easter, uh, we'll open up the sanctuary and just offer a time uh, for people to come in on an individual or a couple basis to, uh, uh, and have a guided, a guided meditation type of thing uh, to go through for Good Friday, and that'll just kind of be open all day. So those are things to know and to think about. Uh, if you have any questions, let us know. We're excited to get to worship this morning. Let me pray for us as we continue. Dear God, we come, and you invite us to come. And may we be reminded of that, encouraged by that, and challenged by that. And as we come, may we bring all of ourselves to all of you. Help us to trust you uh, with that. Help us to trust you with us and all that that means. And God, you are faithful and good, and we thank you for it. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's continue. Oh, how high would I climb mountains if the mountains were where you hide? Oh, how far I'd scale the valleys if you grace the other side. Oh, how long have I chased rivers from lowly seas to where they rise against the rush of grace descending from the source of its supply. Cause in the highlands and the heart, you need the more less inclined. Cause I would search and stop at nothing. You're just not that hard to find And I will praise you on the mountain And I will praise you in the mountains in my way You're the summer where my feet are So I will praise you in the valleys all the same And oh, let God with shadows and all as faithful when the night leads me astray you're the heaven where my heart is in the highlands in the heartache all the same oh, 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 oh. oh how far would need your glory does your kindness extend the path from where your feet rest on the sunrise to where you sweep the sinners past? Oh, how fast would you come running if just a shadow me through the night? Trust my steps through all my failures. And walk me out the other side For who could dare ascend that mountain The valley hill called Calvary But for the one I call good shepherd Who like a lamb was slain for me
And I will praise you on the mountains And I will praise you in the mountains in my way You're the summer where my feet are So I will praise you in the valleys all the same No less God within the shadows No less people in the nightly tears You're the heaven where my heart is Wherever I walk, wherever I am, you make a move mountain, wherever I stand, if ever I walk through the valley of death, I sing through the shadow, my song of a sin. Whatever I walk through, wherever I My brothers and sisters, reconciled to God by the mercy of Christ, we pray with confidence for the needs of the church and the world. I ask you to take a moment of, stay standing as we take a moment of silence to pray for those needs of the church and the world around us. And then I'll close us in a time of prayer. Through Christ you make us a new creation, O God. For with him we pass from sin to the new life of grace. Accept our prayers in the warm embrace of your compassion and welcome all people to the festive banquet of your table where we may rejoice in your love and celebrate the inheritance you have given to us. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I ran away, your love never fails. I know I still make mistakes, but you have new mercy for me every day. Your love never fails.
open seas, you're the never fail. The chasm was far too wide, I never thought I'd reach the other side, you're the never fail. Never fail. children to come forward and meet me for the children's sermon. Hey friends, it's good to see you. Well, some of you know me and some of you don't, but my name is Mr. Canaan. Or you could drop the Mr. if you want to. Or you could add Doctor if you need, if you need to. <laughs> I think that's funny. Yes, I'm not that kind of doctor, though. Okay, um, you want to take a trip with me? Okay, so I have a, I have a game we're going to play. It's called I Spy. Do you know how to play I Spy? You know how to play I Spy? Okay, so let's walk over here. Come with me. This way, we're going to go right here. Okay, and we're going to stand, and we're going to look this way. All right? Okay, so I spy with my little eye something light blue. Which one? What do you think that is? It's a baby Jesus. Yes. Okay. I spy with something colored Something colored red. Do y'all want, which one is it? Oh, is that, is that right, Blair? Blair, okay, one last time. Something colored white. White. Mm. Oh, wait, that's the blanket. 
The blanket. Okay, so baby Jesus. So you've already noticed that there's baby Jesus in the window, right? Yeah. Okay, we'll play this a little bit. When you come back after church, you and I can play, okay? Does that sound good? All right. So one of the things that we're going to be doing over the next few weeks, especially as we get ready for Easter, is we're going to be looking at the windows some. Have you ever noticed our windows yeah. before? They're pretty, aren't they? Well, so you know, that one there, right? I was a guy. He made these windows. Isn't that awesome? Okay, so I want you, what I want you to notice is that Jesus is in all of these pic- pictures here, right? Even that one, yeah. And so uh, today we're thinking about baby Jesus, how God so loved the world that he sent his son to come down in the form of a baby. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about Jesus, especially as we get ready for Easter, about Jesus' ministry, what he did when he was little, what he did when he was my age, uh, or before he was my age, right? And then we'll be talking a little bit next week about some of the things that are over there, okay? All right, so does that sound good? Your question? Why is there a man climbing that wall? Oh, man, we're going to be talking about that next, uh, next week. I think that's next week. Will you be here next week? All right, can, can you hold off and get the answer next week? Okay, good. Well, I'm excited to see you, and I'm excited that we'll be talking about our windows because they help us remember the story of Jesus started as a baby. My favorite picture is when he was a baby. When he was a baby. Okay, can I say a prayer for us, and then y'all can go to Children's Church? Okay. All right. Okay, y'all bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you sent your son and that you made art and the guy who made these windows so that we could see them and remember the wonderful story of your son. In your name we pray. Amen. As some of you may know, and some of you will not, um, and maybe if some of you noticed, my time has rotated off for the children's sermon. Everybody got to bring objects. Ooh, let's bring something from our house to do for children's ser- sermon. And one person who was there every week didn't get to bring his stuff. So I brought my stuff this week. So you get a little bonus but it will tie into where we're at in Luke chapter 13 today. First, we have a magnolia leaf, which comes out of the magnolia tree uh, in our courtyard. And Jesus is going to talk, uh, tell a parable, as he often does, using parables. And in those parables, uh, using a, um, the example uh, from, a, from a vineyard, uh, from, a, in this case, a garden. There weren't a lot of magnolia trees in the deep south of Palestine uh, when Jesus was talking. But uh, if you get by our courtyard, or you go out there today, or sometime uh, this week, if you're driving by Kick- driving on Kickapoo and look back at it, you'll notice that uh, last week a company came in and uh, cleaned out a bunch of the uh, the old the old stuff, uh, trimmed uh, several of our bushes back, and even cut some branches off uh, parts of the mag- the two magnolia trees that are out there. And so the magnolia leaf uh, reminds us and helps us look forward today during the sermon that what Jesus is getting to is that repentance, turning from one way and going another way, is just like when a gardener trims back uh, the trees or cuts out uh, what doesn't need to be growing there anymore. And Jesus gets very serious with this simple parable to make it um, about individuals and about communities or groups of people that sometimes what sin does is it grows up and grows around and it not only keeps things from growing, it actually kills them and it doesn't allow them uh, to remain at all. And the same things happen uh, in our life when we just let things go away. And so in this theme of loss, today we're going to talk about sometimes we have to lose our way, lose our way of doing things, lose the way things are going, and find where Christ is going and where Christ is leading us and allow God 
allow the power of the Holy Spirit to clean those things up, to take those things out that shouldn't be there. Second thing I have is some fig newtons. It's not a cookie, it's a newton. And Jesus uses in, the, in this particular parable the fig tree, which in, in fact were much more common uh, in Palestine and Israel at the time. Jesus would pass a, pig, a fig tree, not a pig tree, a fig tree uh, all the time when he was walking. The disciples would pass fig trees. The people, it was a walking culture. They would see uh, not a lot of cars in first century Palestine. They would see fig trees all the time uh, as they were walking around. And they would partake in the fruit of the fig tree. It was a common part of their, uh, of their diet. Now, I'll be in full disclosure. I got these fig newtons at the gas station on the corner of Harrison and MacArthur. I, I'm just going to guess they're not a real popular seller, so probably not real f- fresh figs uh, in there. But the fruit of the fig tree that we can partake in, that, we, that the people who are listening to Jesus was a part of their culture and a part of their life and a part of what they would have with their families, a part of what they would have when they would have people over. They understood that the key to a good fig was a healthy tree. And so Jesus makes a similar point, but even deeper saying that if a fig tree fails to produce figs, it should eventually be cut down and taken out. We didn't have any trees actually removed uh, in our courtyard, but we had, again, we had them trimmed back and some uh, parts cut off. Why? To, uh, to, so that the product, so that the fruit of, in that case, the, what they were supposed to bear would bear out. We like good fruit, and so we have to take care of the trees. What happens in our lives is, and Jesus, again, makes this point first corporately, like commu- as a community, and then because the community is made up of individuals, it affects the individuals as well. If there is sin at the root, if there is evil around the root, that affects the growth. That affects what comes out. And so when we think of those things societally, culturally, systemically, that are sinful, we have to often go to the root. We might need to lose things around the roots. We might need to lose things that we've just accepted culturally or internally in order for good things to grow. And so I, in thinking about this, our, our parlor class, one of our Sunday school classes, was reading the book uh, Cast um, that came out sev- uh, now several years ago. But in Cast, the author explores systemic racism. And as a, for me, uh, as a white person reading Cast, gr- who's grown up in this country their entire life, there are things that contribute to racism that I'd never thought about before. And they're systemic things. Other systemic sins or um, societal sins, the, the sinful disparity between rich and poor, between those who have and those don't, those are, that's, a systemic, that's a systemic sin. Idolatry, which all of these contribute to one another. Um, the sort of subconscious exaltation of things even above God. The idolatry of stuff. The idolatry of things that in and of themselves might be just fine, but when they're put in a place that they shouldn't be, they become idolatrous. They become ungodly. Those are systemic things. And in order to address that, we have to get at the root. And we'll see that uh, as Jesus does that in, uh, in Luke chapter 13 uh, and through this, through this parable. In this text that we're going to look at, it says verses 1 through 9. We're going to specifically look at um, 5 through 9 and then even 8 and 9 as you see there on the screen. Now, at least maybe possibly one of you will remember that we were in Luke 13 last week for our sermon. And we were in the latter part uh, of Luke 13. So you might question, well, why did we go back uh, to the front? And that's a really good question. Last week we were looking at the lament. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. He weeps over the spiritual and, and spiritual and in that actual condition of Jerusalem. And out of compassion, and he cries out. We said all this last week, the prophets came. He didn't listen to them. And you killed them. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would long to bring you under the comfort of my wing. Now we go back today to the first verses, and we realize 
the reason for the lament. What has led to these to this people being in this condition and what leads us as a people and as individuals to be in a place where we are apart from God, missing out on the love that God has for us, missing out on the comfort and care that God has for us. And what causes us to miss out is we miss the opportunity to come to God. And thus we sit in the judgment, the judgment of what? The judgment of our sin. And if left unkept, if left unaddressed, that sin separates us from God and we miss out on what God has for us. There is a very reasonable and helpful, perhaps, argument to have, well, wait a minute, isn't this talking about Israel? If you look in the last verses of chapter 12, he is addre- Jesus is addressing those people in front of him and says, you look at the sky and you see warnings and you heed those warnings. But all of these other warnings have come from God and you don't pay attention to those. And then he addresses specifically the nation of Israel, the people of God. And so is it even right for us as um, non-Israelites, and I'm assuming, I haven't polled everyone, I'm assuming also non-Jews, to look at this and to draw application from it? Or is this only for Israel? Is this only about a nation? Is this only about Israelites? And that becomes a big question for all of Scripture, because I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of the Bible mentions Israel and the Israelites. Old Testament, for sure. New Testament, the Gospels, and after that as well. So what do we do with that? There are a lot of books and a lot of theories uh, espoused on what do you do with those, um, not only those judgments, but also those promises uh, that are for Israel, that are mentioned uh, towards Israel. What do you do about God's relationship with the Israelites? What do you do that in a modern, in a modern non-Israelite context? Or what does that mean for modern Israel? All of those kind of questions. There are some who will say, since this is being broadcast, let me say, I am not saying this. There are some who would say, just take everything in the Bible, especially the New Testament, that applies to Israel, and just replace it with the church. Replace it with what we understand is the gathering, the called out ones of Christians now, the church, and you just swap one term for another, and that's, and that's what it means. That has, you know, that would draw on places where the Bible says in Christ there is no, uh, there is no Jew or Greek, but we are one in Christ Jesus. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That, and there's other ways that verse is used, uh, but those and, and different other reasons why that, why people might hold that, uh, might hold that theory. The problem with that is you have God initiating a relationship with the specific people, Israel, all the way back in the Old Testament, and maintaining that throughout all of Scripture, and even into the latter part of the New Testament, and. Um, not only, not only in the book of Romans and Paul, but other places as well, uh, still talking about his relationship with Israel even after the ascension of Christ. And so that sort of replacement idea doesn't seem to meet up the whole scrutiny uh, of Scripture. There's another, there are other theories, and, and some would, would go along the line of, yes, in fact, God has two plans. God has a plan for Christians who are not Jews, and then God has a plan for all of Israel. He has, separate, he has separate plans and separate things that he's doing. Again, you could hunt and peck different scriptures uh, to find a, and uphold that. I'm not so sure if that's where I would fall down um, either. Here's where we're going to look at this today. I'm going to say that this, this scripture and others that seem to address Israel and Israelites also address us, also address other people and individual believers. Because in God's relationship with Israel and God's relationship with the chosen people, he is showing us how he relates to all people. And in Christ, we are brought into relationship with God. 
And so we need to learn what that means. Who are we in relationship with, with and what does it mean to walk in relationship with God? As for the questions of what is going to happen to Israel when Christ returns and, and those kind of things, um, it could be argued that I'm going to take a cheap answer, a cheap way out, but I'm going to say I don't know. I'm going to fall on what I do know. And what I do know is in Scripture and throughout the gospel, Jesus seems to be pretty central. And so an association, a relationship with Christ seems to be very vital and pretty essential. We do well to understand God as one in relationship with his people. We are his people in Christ. And so part of being in that relationship with God is knowing the, the judgment that comes upon those who remain in sin and those who don't deal with sin. Part of knowing that relationship is knowing that Death comes, spiritual death comes when we ignore what sin is and what sin does in our lives. It also reminds us that God is faithful and merciful and patient with us, calling us to himself, constantly calling us to himself, constantly helping us and showing us and empowering us and enabling us, and by his own power acting on our behalf to remove that sin, to cut back those weeds, or to cut out those weeds and cut back those branches so that we might live the fruitful lives that God has called us to. Let's see how that plays out in the text. In Luke chapter 13, um, we'll go ahead and read all, all nine verses. We're going to focus on five and nine and specifically eight, even eight and nine, more specifically eight and nine. Now, as Jesus was teaching, he's talking about interpreting the times. There were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Evidently, there was a synagogue, and in that area, uh, Pilate had the soldiers attack uh, some of the Galileans and kill them. Uh, this is only recorded in the book of Luke. As is the, uh, Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners? Than all the other Galileans, because they suffered this way. I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Jesus is taking the reality of physical death and putting spiritual death right there with it. Or, verse 4, or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them. Uh, we read a lot about the pool of Siloam where some healing took place. This is a tower at the corner of the gate around Jerusalem. Evidently, a tower fell and killed some, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. And so he takes these things that people would think about one thing about. Like they wanted to know, they were, they were coming from a perspective of, were these people worse sinners because they died in this tragic way? Jesus says no, and then he pivots the conversation as he often does to what you really need to be concerned about is your spiritual, where you are spiritually with God and what the, what the life is there and if there is life. And so to focus in on that, he tells this parable in verse 5 or 6. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should, you, why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. So in this parable, Jesus is talking about judgment. Judgment coming. He, the people who are there, will, who are live in person when Jesus is teaching that, they'll recognize this language from the book of Micah and from the other prophets where uh, the judgment of God and the imagery of a vineyard and all of those things was used before. Um, following judgment, Micah chapter 4 talks about how everyone will sit under their own fig tree 
uh, the, um, those who pass, uh, pass the judgment, all of these uh, type of images would be in their mind. Will they think about this again when Jesus dies on the cross? Certainly he is leaning towards that, that, that his death will be a judgment uh, for all the people. The people who are first reading this, reading Luke and Luke's account, those with Theophilus and others, um, those of whom are Jews, uh, will undoubtedly point, this is written after 70 AD, which 70 AD was the destruction uh, of Jerusalem. And they'll read it, maybe, are they reading judgment uh, into that and, and asking those questions? Probably. And Luke, in recording the teaching of Jesus, and Jesus in particular, is wanting us to center in on sin and the spiritual death and the offer of and the need for repentance. They're faced with a choice. Jeremiah chapter 21, verse 8 says, I lay before you today a choice between life and death. And so there's a similar offering in this parable. They would have been so familiar with this imagery, and we are, uh, we are as well. And, and the story is there's somebody who owned that vineyard. He didn't live there. He didn't work it. He owned that vineyard. Someone else was sent to be in charge of it. And the man comes back, the person comes back to look in on their investment. And it's a simple strategy for them. I have been paying you, person in charge. I have this land, and right in the middle of it is this fig tree. And I'm not getting any figs. And for three years, this has been the case. Wasting soil, wasting effort, wasting power, you know, laborers, all of this kind of stuff is wasted because it hasn't produced fruit in three years. And the one in charge stands up and says, give me one more year. And he doesn't just say, give me one more year and I'm going to cross my fingers and hope it gets better. He says, no, give me one more year. I'm going to take the soil around it. I'm going to pull it back. I'm going to dig around it. What I'm going to do when I dig, I'm going to look at the roots and get something into the roots that will help it, fertilizer and, and those kind of things. And I'm going, to, I'm going to take care of it and come back in a year. And if it's still not producing fruit, cut it down. But if it is, fine, let it be. There is a time frame here. There is a limited amount of opportunity. But there is opportunity. And that is the message and the call for repentance. So when those people came out in the courtyard on Sunday, on, on this week, I forget what day, they came Tuesday. Let's call it Tuesday. They came out, what did they have to do? What do you have to do in your flower gardens or flower beds at home? You look what shouldn't be there or too much of something that is there. And you address it. You pull it out. You get rid of it. You burn it or you dispose of it in some way. Why? Because it's important to you that what needs to grow there grows. So on an individual level, as we look at our lives and we ask God and we, through the power of the Holy Spirit, are there habits, are there thoughts, are there things in our life that we have just left? We've just ignored for one reason or another and we haven't even seen how they've grown into hurtful and harmful things with our relationship with God and even our relationship with others. And God calls us on us to lose it. Lose those things. This is repentance. Stop where you're going, turn, and go the other direction. Choose the way of life or of death. And God calls upon us to choose the way of life. Now from a societal, cultural, community perspective. Look at the roots. Look at the fruit. Look at what's going on in your collective place. Your church, your family, your society, the world around you. Look at what's been born out. Look at what we have. And then look at the roots. Are there things 
systemically that contribute to bad fruit, that contribute to ungodly things, such as what we named earlier, racism, disregard of the poor, idolatry. We are at an important time where we've been allowed to, and it's not, <laughs> I'm not saying in any way that it's good, I'm saying it's apparent, to see bad fruit. Things are not how they should be. So God calls upon us individually and collectively to look around, to dig into the soil of our hearts and of the heart of who we are as people as brothers and sisters supposedly in Christ. And so it does center in and come down, we as the church, what can we do that people are mistreated and set aside merely because of the color of their skin? We can throw up our hands and say, well, you know what? I think it's always been that way. I think that's, I think that's always been a problem. I, I, you know, I can remember my grandpa saying something about that, and you know that probably wasn't right. And I believe that the Spirit of God calls us, beckons us, yells at us. What are you doing about it? Are you confessing? Are you asking for forgiveness? Are you repenting of your own role in it? And what are you doing to help others to move forward? We think about well, it's just always been that there's people who have and there's people who don't. And I can remember when I, and we, 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 we personalize and say, I can remember when I didn't have. I've had to go through some tough times. Why can't they just get over it? And when it comes down in anything to a discussion between us and them, that's a pretty good indication that something's wrong at the root. That, they're, that, that That's the root of the problem that we've already talked about us and them and anything. And then idolatry, good things, misplaced, and they become objects of worship. And they, mis they, they take the place of our allegiance and our dedication to the God who has called us. Certainly material things can become idolatrous. Certainly things that entertain us can become idolatrous. Certain things that we like and that we kind of hold to ourselves become idolatrous. And we've got to look at the root. The invitation today is are you willing are you willing to be examined? Are you willing to allow Christ and the Holy the presence of the Holy Spirit to go in to your life and to expose the weeds and the hurtful things? And then are you trusting enough to let God call you out of it. He is merciful. That he is in the act of redemption. That there are things that he has created and allowed that actually bring us out of the way that leads to death and the way that leads to life. Are there any things about these specific things that we've mentioned that center in on you or the community that you represent that God wants to do something about? So I'm asking you to think. I'm asking for those thoughts to be attached with your heart, to be attached with your actions, because the Bible knows no separation. The Bible, Scripture, and what God calls us to knows no di dichotomy. For what the Holy Spirit created within us and moves within us is it affects our heart, it causes us to think differently, and it changes the way that we act. It all works together. And so the Scripture will say, therefore, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern or the roots of this world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind so that you might know what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So I'm inviting us to think. And as we think, to allow our hearts to be changed, and as our hearts are changed by the God who loves us, to allow action to be taken as God might see fit. If you would stand with me as we pray, please.
Dear God, as we come to you, we thank you that you are faithful and good. That you are not here to use sin as a reason to push us down and to punish or condemn us, but you are here to save us from our sin, to call us out to new life. May we listen and may we follow. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Let's sing together. I will praise you on the mountain And I will praise you in the mountains in my way You're the summit where my feet are So I will praise you in the valleys all the same And no less God within the shadows No less faithful when the night leads me song of a oh, 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 oh. As we are sent out today, may we be sent out for the words of this prayer uh, from St. Patrick. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me. Christ beneath me, Christ above me. Christ on my right, Christ on my left. Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down. Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me. Christ in the mouth of every man who speaks of me. Christ in the eye that sees me, Christ in the ear that hears me. I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through a belief in the threeness, through a confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. Grace and peace to you. Thank you so much. From the greatest of all valleys come the pastures we call grace. A mighty river flowing upwards from a deep but empty I will praise you on the mountains. I will praise you in the mountains in my way. You're the sun where my feet are. So I will praise you in the valleys all the same. And no less God within the shadows. No less Hi.